Hey, good uh, morning. My name is uh, Gina Sweat. I am the fire director for the city of Memphis, and I'll be giving the update for the uh, city of Memphis today for the, on behalf of the joint task force. Um, today, I want to just give you uh, an update on our, the city of Memphis effort to manage the vaccine, vaccination process. Um, as you know, the city uh, took over that process last week on the 23rd. And uh, since then, we have been uh, putting a lot of processes in place to make sure that we manage everything properly. Uh, we are uh, sourcing uh, the five fixed site mass vaccination sites um, and at least one pop up a day since then. We're also, we understand there's a lot of uh, interest in uh, doing pop ups in the community and we are developing a process for doing that. So look for information to be coming out on how to uh, set up a pod in the community. Uh, specifically with churches and uh, different groups, different organizations. Uh, we will set a process in place and we're willing to work with, we definitely want to work with the community uh, to get this vaccine, vaccine out as many uh, different parts of the city and the county as we can. Uh, since we uh, put the processes in place, uh, we've also been identifying key personnel to, to put in place so that we have uh, backups uh, to backups. I'm actually uh, Chief McGowan's back, backup as the accountability person for the process. And uh, so we've identified a, a lot of people and putting those p uh, pieces in place, uh, getting people trained and making sure that uh, we are documenting and, and getting all the, the information uh, captured as it should be. Um, I know we do recognize uh, that for some time there's been uh, a lot of uh, concern about the uh, scheduling process. Uh, we have uh, been meeting with the state and we have been, uh, hopefully we will be bringing on the VRAS uh, registration and management system uh, from the state. Uh, our personnel received, we identified our key personnel, they received training from the state on yesterday and we hope to be able to bring that on board in our community by mid-March. Um, that's a very, uh, a lot more robust system than the Sign Up Genius and we believe that once we get that in place it's going to really help with a lot of the confusion we've had in the past and it's also going to be a lot more user friendly for the public. Um, we also had uh, visitors uh, to our site, uh, our city site this week from the um, CDC and from the state of Tennessee. Uh, they came, just toured our facility, uh, toured our, uh, our processes, uh, gave us some advice and looked and then they also visited a few of the pop-up pods uh, and uh, I think that went very well. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions and, and concerns about uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine coming on board this week. I can tell you that we have a weekly apportionment meeting with the state. Uh, we held that on yesterday. And I think we will not be receiving uh, large quantities of Johnson & Johnson for at least the next two weeks. So it'll be at least two weeks out before we start receiving that. And uh, we'll be putting processes in place so that we make sure that we can receive that, uh, store it properly, and then uh, determine how we're going to uh, get that out into our community. As far as vaccines, yesterday, uh, at all of our uh, fixed pods and our pop-up pods, we were able to uh, get 4,868 shots in arms. We have uh, scheduled today 4,440 shots, and I'm proud to say that our at our five uh, fixed locations, uh, yesterday they had about a 12-minute wait time in lines. So I think that was uh, it was uh, very good. We've really been working on getting that wait time down so that we can be more uh, conscious of everyone's time. And, and get those uh, as efficiently and effectively as possible. So for now, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Sweat uh, from the Shelby County Health Department. Uh, I would say he's my cousin. We're not quite sure, but we don't know that we're immediately related. But uh, so it'll be the Sweat Show today. Dr. Sweat. Thank you, Chief. And um, yeah, we probably are related, maybe about 100 some odd years ago, I think. But uh, welcome, I'm David Sweat. I'm Deputy Division Director for Shelby County Health Department. And I'm here to give you an update on where we stand as far as the numbers and also talk to you about a testing event that will be in the community on Saturday that we need to highlight. Um, as far as the vaccine campaign, I'll pick up there first. We've had 159,064 vaccine doses administered in Shelby County, and including 111,145 first doses, and then 47,919 people have received both doses and are fully vaccinated at this point in the vaccine campaign. Uh, as far as our case numbers here in Shelby County, 88,343 cases have been reported. 
That includes 129 new cases that were reported yesterday. We're at 1,511 deaths that have occurred through the pandemic over the past year and includes 11 new reports of death that were received by the health department yesterday. As far as Tennessee cases, the total number of cases, Tennessee, 777,935 cases reported so far in Tennessee as of 2 p.m. yesterday. So today we'll certainly uh, be going over 778,000 cases reported. And when we look at the surrounding areas uh, up in Tipton County, we've had 6,953 cases reported. In Fayette County, Tennessee, we've had 4,672 cases reported. In Crittenden County, Arkansas, 5,418 cases reported so far. And in DeSoto County in Mississippi, 19,731 cases. Um, as far as uh, giving you an update on the uh, uh, testing event, I believe we have a graphic about that, if it can be pulled up onto the screen to show people. We are, although we are very actively vaccinating aggressively in the community, and that's what we need to do, we're at 16% of our goal, that's not the only thing that we still need to do. One of the things we still need to do is to test people. People need to continue to be tested because we're averaging 120 plus cases every day being reported. Uh, we had 5,100 plus cases in February reported and uh, we had also 218 deaths reported in February. So we are nowhere near the end of the pandemic just yet. And the most important thing that people can do to start the process of protecting themselves and others is to understand their status. So this Saturday, March the 6th, we will be holding another uh, testing event out in the community, uh, particularly targeting the Latinx community, but, but anyone is welcome. And it is a testing event <clears throat> that is available free to anybody five years old or older. And it will be held at the Church of Ascension Gym on uh, 3680 Rammel Road in Memphis 38128. So the hours would be on Saturday morning from 10 a.m. until 1 p.m. in the afternoon. So if you have symptoms or if you just are curious because we do know that people can have COVID-19 and not have any symptoms, if you want to find out your status, please feel free to come and join us for that test event and you will be tested um, and, and we'll hopefully get your results back in one to two days. We're having a one to two day turnaround time from the laboratories right now throughout the community. But if you don't come to this event and you would like to be tested, there's 17,000 test appointment slots available almost throughout the county this week. And we definitely want to encourage people to continue to get tested. Uh, it is the first step in the process of understanding your status so that if you happen to be COVID positive with or without symptoms, whether those symptoms are severe or mild or non-existent at all, if you find out that you're positive, we want you to continue to isolate for 10 days. And for all of us, the same control measures that we've been uh, encouraging the community to follow for the past year remain important. We need to wear a mask whenever we're out in public. We need to wash our hands frequently or use hand sanitizer to protect ourselves from picking up the virus inadvertently on our hands and touching our eyes or face. We need to stay socially distant from each other six feet or more and by and limit the size of our gatherings. If, whenever we are together with people, make sure those are small gatherings with people, not large gatherings of people that mix uh, population over much. Because we're only 16% of the way through the vaccine campaign so far. We're making progress. We can see the forest thinning out, but we're not out of the woods. The, the, the pandemic is not over. And in this month, we have Easter. We also have spring break. So we know that there's plenty of opportunities for human behavior to re-energize this epidemic, and that is something we do not need. We need to get the vaccine into as many people as possible as soon as we can. And we know that normal times are coming. They're just not quite here yet. With that, I will open up for questions for either me or Chief Sweat. Brad Broders, Local 24. 
Thanks, David. Well, I have you standing there. Uh, as you well know, uh, Monday is the anniversary of our first confirmed case. Uh, you, you being with the health department, uh, what lessons have we learned? What challenges have we overcome? And where do you think we are right now, just in the grand scheme of things, getting back to normality? Right. So thank you, Brad, for that question. I really appreciate it. And I've been doing some reflecting on this over the past, uh, you know, since we are approaching the anniversary date of the first case being diagnosed in Shelby County. Uh, the first confirmation of that we received on March the 7th in 2020. That's when we knew that we had COVID for sure in the community. So along the way, what I would say is Memphis and Shelby County and the Mid-South all this area we've been going through a microcosm of what the entire country has gone through right so we we had the virus introduced into our community it was brand new it was scary we didn't quite know what was uh, going on we made every effort to contain it but we didn't have a lot of things in place that that no community in america had a, things in place that we needed to do we didn't have the infrastructure for testing we we had to invent that right we had to work with the laboratories with ut health science center all the different partners to figure out the best way to to provide testing services to our residents and and to make sure that was there was equitable and free access to that and to grow that network scale it up big enough that it could handle the needs of our of all of our communities so that was some of our first challenges back a, a year ago and we also had uh, never been confronted with an infectious disease that was spreading this rapidly, multiplying this quickly, and, uh, and, and was this deadly that we had to manage. And so we had to work through the contact tracing processes. We had to work with the state of Tennessee and the Centers for Disease Control to develop a lot of health information and get that out to the public because this was an emerging disease. It's a new disease. And so we had all of that going on. And then through the summer, we had to, um, use the federal cares act dollars to add human resources to the effort so that we could be more robust in our response with the contact tracing and with the environmental inspections and the health directives and then uh, all the different challenges that we had from july through december now throughout all that we we had uh, two major waves that hit our community coming uh, out of the first wave and into the surge of the summer of june july and august we went through a first wave, our hospitalizations were very high, and uh, we were concerned about the, uh, the emergency departments and the hospitals and the intensive care unit beds being overwhelmed in the hospitals, and we were working with those systems to make sure that they could handle the, the workload, and we got through that. And then we came out, and um, in September, we had a period of, of sustained decline. Everything was looking good. We, we were able to start school back up, but then we get into the fall surge, and it was much bigger than what we had experienced through the summer. And uh, so we had to work together with all our partners to manage that surge and, once again, protect the hospitals, help the schools uh, get through the whole process of the fall, uh, investigating outbreaks and clusters and uh, dealing with nursing homes and all the different things that we did last year. And now... We've survived that too. We, we went through the Thanksgiving surge, the Christmas surge, New Year's, and and now we've come down into lower reproductive rates. And our positivity rate right now is 5.7%. Uh, we're averaging about 120 cases a day. But as a community, what do I think that we've learned? I think we've learned that we have are resilient. I, I think we've learned we're flexible, that we have the ability to pivot, that we have the ability to partner that we share resources, we share information, and we can mount an effective response as a community. And I have no doubt that we will succeed with the vaccine campaign as well as a community in partnership with the city of Memphis and the healthcare systems and the pharmacies and all the people who are involved. So uh, I think that's what I've learned from the uh, experience of this year. Thanks, David. And the second question is to Director Gina Sweat. Not sure uh, the family connection there, but uh, um, just on the topic, Director Sweat of no-shows. I know yesterday it popped up again, about 12% no-shows. I know their alerts were sent out Tuesday late in the afternoon. Uh, could you talk to the public about kind of the, the issue of no-shows and um, will the city continue to send alerts late in the afternoon, working with VaxQ? How can we kind of... Uh, 
work that system out effectively. Well, thank you. thanks for asking that question. So hopefully what happened the uh, day before yesterday was an anomaly. Um, as you know, we were, we, you know, we were given a, a huge monumental task and trying to get all the information with a lot of moving parts and a lot of information uh, that we were um, trying to work through. So, uh, and that was complicated by the week before, there was no vaccinations uh, conducted because of the, the storm that came through. And uh, there was some confusion about who had appointments, when, and were they rescheduled or not. And so some people literally, you know, were making multiple appointments uh, just to make sure that they were covered. So hopefully the new VRAS system uh, actually uh, will help with that. Um, it's for management of the vaccine process. People should be able to go in and schedule both their first and second dose. And then, uh, but the big thing that we need from the public is, uh, especially once we get in the system, if you have made an appointment and you're not gonna uh, keep it, if you could cancel it, that gives a spot that's open for another member of our community that needs a shot. The only way to manage the vaccine distribution process is to be able to uh, predict and control how much vaccine that we need to uh, have thought and ready to distribute every day. And so that's why we uh, have to require people to uh, set your appointment and then at these vaccine pod sites to, uh, to not arrive more than uh, an hour before your scheduled appointment. Uh, if we can get the public's cooperation with that, uh, we can continue to uh, have these uh, lower wait times where we don't have people waiting in line. And then also so that we make sure that we have enough vaccine uh, to distribute everyone who has an appointment that day. Kelly Roberts, WMC. Good afternoon. My first question is about moving into that 1C phase. Um, I don't know if this would be a health department or a city of Memphis question, but when it comes, so obviously the demand is going to go up. Uh, do you feel, you know, ready to meet that demand? And also, the there's a lot of health conditions that fall under 1C. Will there be any need to prove anything, or is this a good faith effort um, with this vaccine? So uh, you're absolutely right. As the phases open up, that definitely means more members uh, of our community are, will be uh, have access to uh, vaccinations. Uh, no, we will not be requiring documentation uh, on site of the vaccine, but what we will be requiring is in the system, when you schedule an appointment, they, uh, members will have to attest that they meet the conditions of this phase. Um, so uh, that will be part of the process. Uh, as we, we are putting the system in place now, we're building the machine, but we're also building it where it's expandable so that as uh, more and more vaccine is available to our community, we also have the uh, ability to get those shots out and get them in arms. Thank you, and I just have a quick follow-up um, based on your answer. Uh, so when you go and make an appointment um, saying that you, you have a certain health condition, is it kind of just saying, you know, clicking the health condition you have, or will there be more proof needed in the appointment making process? No, the, the, we, we don't require any uh, proof and neither does the state is my understanding that there is no requirement from the state. Um, it will just be basically an attestment that you, uh, it will probably uh, have information about what is included in the phase and that you attest that you meet those conditions. Dominique Dillon, Fox 13. Um, do you have any concern that by moving on to the next phase, this could somewhat take away from elderly people who have not had their chance to get vaccinated? Okay, I think Dr. Sweat has a, an answer for that. Um, uh, and certainly you can come back and answer the part about it, uh, the one part of it, but just to help you understand where we are with the, the numbers, Right now, uh, 48, almost 50% of all the people aged 75 and above have been vaccinated. So of the population in that age group, they have received it, almost half. And we're at more than 30% of the people between the age of 65 and 74 who have availed themselves of the opportunity to be vaccinated since they are currently eligible in making those appointments. So we do know that uh, we're not at the levels we'd like to be in every age group we'd like to be at 70 percent or above uh, but at least i can tell you right now that more than a third of the age 65 to 74 year old population has been vaccinated and about half the the population age 75 and above has been vaccinated as of this moment in time 
um, if and how you're ramping up volunteers and sites uh, for an influx in the number of people showing up next week? Um, so we will have um, a fixed number of appointments available every week. And uh, as those appointments become available, as we uh, receive additional vaccine from the state, we will be ramping up uh, the pods and the scheduling and the number of appointments to be able to deliver all the, all the vaccine that we can get from the state. So as we are, are able, uh, currently, as you know, uh, we inherited uh, uh, some uh, of a inventory of vaccine. So we're working through getting all that out and getting it on this, in people's arms within the next couple of weeks. And then we hope to be, uh, uh, at that point, we'll be able to uh, ramp up. And as our uh, apportionment from the state uh, increases, uh, we're working with the, the pods, the different groups, and also setting up additional mass uh, vaccination pods if we need to. Uh, we're working through all those processes now. So as our apportionment increases, so will our capability to be able to get those shots in arms. Catherine Burgess, Commercial Appeal. Hi, um, good afternoon. Um, I recently just saw, saw data from the American Healthcare Association showing that nursing homes have seen, an, I think it was an 82% decline in COVID cases since the peak in December, um, which they attribute to vaccines. Um, and I'm wondering if we've seen a similar decline um, in nursing home cases since the vaccine started rolling out here in Shelby County. Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, we, we definitely are seeing a decline in the number of cases in our nursing home aged population and the vaccine penetration into the nursing homes has been very good. We continue to work with all of those facilities, however, to monitor for signs of clusters and then uh, are responding to those clusters with outreach to understand many different aspects of that. Part of it is vaccine uptake uh, do you have a population there that has refused the vaccine at some higher level? Or, um, you know, is there evidence of some other issue going on? But also to continue to emphasize the infection control practices. But we definitely do see the numbers coming down across the board, including in our nursing home population. So we're participating in that along with the rest of the country, yes. Great, thank you. Um, second, with regard to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, I'm wondering um, if you are receiving specific direction as to how to distribute it. Um, and if so, if that direction, if it'll be given out the same as the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, or if it might be given out um, differently, for example, to um, homeless shelters, to homebound populations, um, if there's going to be any distinction there since it is such a different type of vaccine. I'm gonna let Director Sweat answer that, but the, uh, you know, as, according to what uh, Chief McGowan said on Tuesday, uh, you know, we're waiting for instructions. That was the most recent word I heard on that, uh, but please. Yes, we, um, we haven't really uh, received any additional guidance on how uh, the state intends for us to uh, administer the Johnson & Johnson. So uh, we do know that we won't get any for within the next two weeks. And so we uh, look forward to, once we receive that information, we'll be able to share that with the public. And uh, at this point, we're, we're just uh, getting the processes in place and making sure that we have the storage capacity uh, to be able to dispense it properly. And then once we receive additional uh, direction from the state, we'll definitely be following their guidelines. Omir Yusuf, Daily Memphian. Hello, my question, my first question is for Director Sweat. Could you just enlighten us more on the process behind managing and storing the vaccines since you all have taken over um, since last Tuesday? Uh, certainly I can. So uh, the Memphis Fire Department, uh, specifically our EMS division, um, has been uh, has been an approved uh, vaccinate, vaccination receiver uh, for a number of years. Normally we uh, handle all the vaccination for our, uh, our staff, our employees, our firefighters and paramedics. Um, we have been involved somewhat with it. We had a partnership with the health department a few years ago to help deliver the H1N1 uh, vaccine when we had that issue in our community. So at this point, we have our partners, uh, Regional One and Poplar Health, um, and we have uh, MOUs with them for chain custody. Uh, they are the they receive our vaccine and maintain the uh, cold custody of the vaccine. 
uh, we develop our plan. Uh, we have a weekly vaccination plan. And uh, the next day, we give them a, a request for how much vaccine we plan to distribute the next day. They thaw it out or put it in their refrigerator for thawing the night before. And Memphis Fire Department employees who uh, received just-in-time training last week, uh, we have AccuCoolers that were Accu coolers that were received from the state. Uh, those are uh, specifically uh, used to uh, take the vaccine from uh, our pharmacy partners, uh, from our members who are trained. They then take the vaccine uh, to the specific pod site location, and they maintain the chain of custody of that vaccine until it's distributed to the people who will be uh, pulling the, uh, the vaccine doses and actually putting them in people's arms. That process is monitored. Uh, our, we have, uh, now we have at least two employees uh, assigned to that task at each location. Uh, they monitor those coolers. They have digital thermometers inside them um, that they have to document uh, on an hourly basis that uh, the uh, temperature and control, that's a manual process. And then at the end of the day, uh, any thawed doses come back uh, to our facility uh, or refrigerated. And then those data recorders are logged in electronically and reviewed again to make sure that there were no issues during the day and that everything was documented properly. So um, it's a very uh, meticulous process, um, but it's a very, uh, it is the, one of the key processes in making sure that uh, we handled the vaccine properly and get it out to the community. Was there a follow-up? I do. Uh, I have a follow-up for uh, David. Obviously, uh, you reflected earlier on the upcoming uh, one-year anniversary since our first uh, confirmed COVID case. Do you think that we've gotten through the worst of this, or do you think that there's another potential surge ahead? And if you think that, what could lead to that? Well, thank you for the question. Um, I am very hopeful that we have seen the worst of this. I, uh, I believe that that time period from uh, November through the end of January is probably the worst. Now, that's what I hope. I cannot tell you for sure that that is the case. So you ask, what could change that? The only thing right now that could really change it is either we prematurely as a community and as a, as a country declare victory when we haven't won and open everything up too fast and not enough people have yet been vaccinated and we, we generate another wave, right? That's one thing. Or the new variants from the United Kingdom and South Africa and Brazil and other places that have the ability to either in, uh, evade the uh, protection of the vaccine or they're super spreading highly transmissible strains, getting into people, into the population that is unvaccinated and unprepared for it, creating an explosion of cases. So either of those two things could generate a new wave, a new surge. And um, that's why we continue to ask for people to be patient and follow the social distancing and control measure guidelines and get vaccinated so that we can avoid those pitfalls. Alex Coleman, WREG. Alex, I think you're self-muted. Okay, we'll move on. Katie Reardon, WKNO. Yeah, hi, I'll try to make this quick in the interest of time. Uh, David, you started to answer part of my question, but um, back in January, uh, Dr. Lisa Piercy had said that she predicted the, the UK variant would be the dominant strain here by March. And so I'm wondering if there's any evidence of that or if uh, we just aren't doing enough testing to be able to tell. Yeah, thank you for the question, Katie. Uh, so, so actually, uh, that was the concern, right? But uh, so far, we have detected the UK variant. We have detected it here. But it is not the predominant strain in Shelby County yet. At this point in time, it remains other strains, what we would call wild-type Wuhan strains, that remain the largest um, sequenced uh, return population distribution of, of viral strains. But we are very concerned. We're seeing an increase in those UK strains. We're seeing also some uh, few from Brazil. We've seen uh, a new one from Mexico. So, I mean, we're definitely doing enough surveillance 
to find these strains, uh, and that is a function of testing, but it's also a function of sequencing. And the UT Health Science Center is doing sequencing, but some of our laboratories are also adding their own capability for sequencing. So we're going to wind up sequencing even more vir uh, of these specimens to see what the distribution of viral genomes is. But uh, so I'm not too worried that we won't detect them. The only reason that we might fail to detect them is if people fail to test. And that's the other reason that we want people to keep coming out for testing. Because if, uh, if there is a change in the mix of viral strains that it's going to be important for the epidemiology, the first way we would know about that is if somebody got a test and then it got to the lab and could be sequenced. Great. And, and so I, I heard you just, um, if you could expand on that, though, uh, you said there's now been a Mexico strain detected. If you could just give us a better idea of, of what we have um, seen here and the magnitude. It's, it's a, a, a small number of cases representing a new strain that uh, was detected last Friday by UT Health Science Center in sequencing. It's a strain out of Mexico. Like I said, there's, we're not, uh, we're also seeing homegrown strains, strains from New York, strains from California. So there's, there's a lot of um, robust effort to look for strains and look for changes. And when you look at the history of the last year, um, by month, month of my, in fact, the laboratory directors uh, and I and, and others looked at this specifically last night to watch how viral strains have changed over time since last March a year ago, and uh, not every not every strain variant is important, but some are, and so the ones that we're watching for are strains that have genetic capabilities to either evade the vaccine. There's a few of those in the world, or to be highly transmissible, like the UK and South African variants, they're really easy to transmit. So we're watching for these things uh, so that we can respond pretty aggressively if we find them. But uh, right now, I would say that it is not yet the case that those, those uh, strains of concern have become the dominant strains. We'll go back to Alex Coleman with WREG. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Can hear you now. All right, thank you very much. Again, when it uh, comes to uh, the additional testing uh, in the Latinx community, what changes have we seen there? Have, has there been additional awareness? Have you seen more people stepping up recently? Or is there still a concern that a lot of people are very hesitant about still being vaccinated? Uh don't know about the vaccine aspect of your question, but I don't have any information about that specifically from the Latinx community. But what I can say is that through early in the uh, pandemic a year ago, we were seeing a disproportionate impact on uh, on our black community and on our Latinx community, those, those racial demographic and ethnic communities. And so throughout, the pandemic here, at least in the Mid-South or at least in Shelby County, we have not seen a hesitancy uh, really from any part of our population to get tested. Uh, but we continue to want to outreach to everybody because one of the things we're committed to throughout this response in every aspect is ensuring equity and ease of access for all people. Thank you. We are out of time. Are there any closing messages from any panelists? Anybody? No, but thank you. Thank you to all of you. Stay the course. Make your appointments. Go get your shots. Keep your appointments. Wear your masks. And be, we'll be back next Tuesday. Thanks, everyone.